the first today is really going to focus on the PDSA cycle, so really making a plan. All right. So really what I want to do is establish that why you need quality improvement, sort of introduce some concepts about base, practice-based learning and improvement. Oh, thank you. Uh, introduce the PDSA cycle, try to go through the planning phase and some tools that you might use. All right. So what do you guys think of when you think of quality? What is quality? I don't need these now. Seriously, even though he turned off the lights, you don't have to stop. <laughs> you don't have to sleep yet. Please don't sleep yet. What is quality? We were talking about medical care. Come on, Alan, you are never quiet. Come on. Oh, you are doing lectures. Okay, so real, all right. So the Institute of Medicine has actually defined something, what they think is quality. So they think quality health care means providing patients with appropriate services. So that doesn't mean everything, but appropriate services in a technically competent manner. That is part of what you learn in residency and, and onward with good communication, shared decision-making, and cultural sensitivity. So it's the whole package. So don't we already give good quality care? I mean, why do we need to talk about quality improvement? How do you think we do for quality of care? Okay, a different question. How many of you aim to not give quality care? I'm happy to see nobody at the VA raised their hand either. That's good. So, <laughs> so that's really good. But if you look at a lot of markers about quality of care, even though we try really hard and really want to do well, we don't necessarily. So you can see on this graphic, in the U.S., this is looking at preventive care within a time frame, uh, given their age and sex. So this is basically uh, um, appropriate screening. So this included blood pressure, cholesterol, PAP, mammogram, FOBTs, or sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy, and a flu shot. Okay, not AAA screening, not, you know, DEXA screening, any of that. You can see in the U.S., on average, we're as good as a coin flip. About 50% of the time, we do all those things that are preventive. And we all know to do them, and we all want to do them, but somehow there are things that get in the way. If you look with people who have no resources or few resources, 60% of those people don't get their quality of care. And then if you're uninsured, uh, I think uninsured all the year, oh, I'm sorry, 58% get them if they're 400 plus of poverty line, the people who are uninsured all the year get about 30%. So we don't do very well in our system. So if you look at it another way, here's health expenditures, and you can see the United States has been going up, 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 and the UK has been going up as well as some other uh, European nations. But when you look at mortality, which is another marker of quality care, our quality, the United States here is in the dots, so this one right here, our quality is actually going down while other people are going up. So even though we're spending more, we're not necessarily delivering quality care. So clearly the system as it works now is not perfect, which you already knew. Um, but quality improvement really aims to try to make improvements in the system so that you can deliver better care that you know how for the patient. All right. So why do you think we have decreased things, uh, decreased results? And this guy, Don Berwick, who's now just uh, been – promoted to a different position. I can't remember if it's in the government or not, but I believe so. Um, he, at this time, he was the head of the Institute for Health Improvement, the IHI, which is a big organization in this area. And he made this quote that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it achieves. So if patients are late getting out of AIM clinic, which, you know, occasionally happens, it's because our system is designed to make that. All right. So the goal of quality improvement really is to change the system so it improves the outcome. It's not really for you to work harder or work longer. It's to make the system and everyone who's in it, not just us, but staff people and the patients and the way everything's set up, make it all improve and work better so that the patient has a better outcome. So the system may be really large, like the UofL Healthcare or the National Health System in Britain, or it can be really small, like your own patient panel. Um, it requires you, if you're going to look at quality improvement, to look at the system and also at the outcomes. So you have to think about, okay, that's why some of you who have started doing chart reviews have found out, okay, my A1C for a lot of patients are great or not great, or I'm doing lots of foot exams, or I'm not giving the flu shot or whatever. But you have to know some data and know some information in order to make some changes. So it's not just making changes for changes' sake. All right, and the other thing is that quality improvement is a part of your practice-based learning and improvement competency. So if you remember that on all your evaluations, you get PBNL, PBL and I, practice-based learning. That is basically looking at your own practice and making changes so that you deliver better care. So this is a big part of what a lot of people think is an important part of becoming a physician. All right, 
So this is really the sort of the summation of practice-based learning and improvement. So you'll see the thing we're going to talk about today is audit. Really, auditing, whoops, that's not the one that comes up first. So the first thing is, you know, looking at self-assessment and giving feedback and learning some knowledge, attitudes, and skills. And remediation, that's where we as program directors help you. You know, if you need some help with knowledge or you have a rotten attitude, we'll give you a little feedback about that. And then improving yourself, okay? But the same thing happens with clinical questions with knowledge, you know, using evidence-based medicine to help your patients. And it also helps in your auditing your own practice. So you look at your performance in the system at wherever you are, and then you'd use this PDSA cycle, so the plan, do, steady, act cycle, in order to improve outcomes. And that's the, that's the goal of being a physician is not to just have a static, not to just get through residency and then stop, but to be a continual learner in all aspects of your, of your um, physician life. Okay. So now that we say, okay, we really think this is important, does it really work? Um, a guy in Indiana, his first name is Alex, this is his last name, Druzik, I think is how you say it, showed that in a residency system, they had improvement in care processes for those projects that are actually implemented. So it is doable within a residency. In a review of 92 projects that Shortell did, about 2 to 30% resulted in significant improvement. So if you were just looking at cost, which some of them were, that was the hardest thing to affect. Care outcomes, like do my patients have better A1C results or um, fewer MIs or things like that about, you know, in the teens. And 30% had better work role definition and efficiencies. Should be an S on there, not just efficiency. Um, so the other thing to take away from this is not, not every quality improvement project will work. So even though you're really interested in improving the way you deliver care and improving the outcomes of your patients, sometimes you'll throw something out there, and it's not effective. And that's part of the quality improvement cycle, is figuring out what works and what doesn't work. All right, so our goal in, in residency really is to prepare you for your future. Okay, so we want you to be able to improve your care with time and to improve the systems you work in so that you can help your patients. And we think you need skills to do this because this is not something people are just naturally born with. <coughs> Sorry. So to... In, in, to achieve outcome improvements, you need some QI skills, and here are some of them. One is to be a physician leader. Guess what? You're already that. You are on teams. You run the ward teams as a second and third year. You've already got some of these skills. But now you have to extrapolate that to the quality improvement area. And every quality improvement project, if it's going to be successful, needs a champion. That means somebody who's willing to push it through. It's just like getting the hard thing done at your house or any other thing, you know, if it's really important, you need somebody to push it through. You have to be able to work in interdisciplinary teams. So making an improvement just in isolation, just an improvement in yourself without involving the other people doesn't work well in quality improvement. So you have to move past the ward team concept to think about the nurses, the social workers, in clinic, the staff people, um, even the patients that you're involved with this. And then the third thing that you need to, to achieve in residency is to use this model of improvement to institute a change as part of a rapid cycle PDSA, which is really what I'm going to focus off on for the rest of the day. Okay, so this is a model for improvement that this guy Nolan from the IHI um, created, and it's a great thing because I didn't have to create this in words, so that was good. So really, if you're looking at improvement, first of all, you have to think, what are you trying to improve? What are you trying to accomplish? What, do you, what is really important to you? How will you know that if you change something, it's an improvement? Or is it one of these projects, like I've done many of, that bombed? Okay. And what change, change can we make in the system that will result in improvement? Not just working harder, not just thinking I'm going to do better, but what change, change can you make in the whole process so it'll do better? And that's when you roll into this PDSA, the Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle. And the reason it has these arrows is that you would make a change, you plan it, you do it, you study and act, and then you modify it. So you keep, this is a continuous circle, really. It's not just a one-time deal. Uh, there's the aim, there's the measurement, and there's the change. You can tell I didn't make that slide either. It's very nice. Okay. So if you're looking at the aim, what are you trying to accomplish? You've got to think about what do you choose as the aim of your project. So sometimes people go, I don't even know what to do. There's lots of problems. How do you figure it out? Um, so these are some things from the uh, Institute of Medicine that they propose might be some areas you might think about if you're looking at to make system changes. And one is that you make safe, you know, patient safety. So if the patient's um, not getting DVT prophylaxis when they come to the hospital, 
that's a safety issue or a patient effective care issue. So you might want to do that. If you're looking at effective care and you know that we get a CT scan maybe on everybody who comes into the emergency room, that might be your area to eliminate overuse of ineffective care or to improve underutilized care, for instance, for pap smears for women at high risk. Um, things that are patient care or things that are timely, you know, timing just for the patient. Efficiencies, things that look at patient satisfaction, and if you're efficient and the system works well, everybody's happier working in it. Or things for equity, meaning, uh, remember that slide where people who were insured got more uh, preventive care than people underinsured, maybe that would be the area that you focused on. Okay. So if you're choosing an aim for your project, something that you're going to look at, what are you trying to accomplish, um, here are a couple other places to look, practically speaking. Look at existing data. So we are having you now start looking at your charts and figuring out what you do well and what you don't do well. So that's already an area. Um, when you get out in private practice, the insurance companies are happy to do this for you and send you a quarterly report. Um, so that will be how many of your patients got A1Cs that were diabetics, um, they give me, I get feedback from Passport all the time about my cost in pharmacy compared to other physicians in the city or in the Passport plan. Um, there are all sorts of data things that are already out there that you just have to access. And sometimes it's, um, you'll have to do a little work and set your clinic up or your office or your hospital practice up a certain way in order to get that, but that's no, you know, hospitals yesterday at our annual staff meeting, they had length of stay, they had, um, patient satisfaction numbers. There's all sorts of things that are already out there. So you don't have to recreate the wheel, okay? Think about how you do compared to national guidelines and also what's really important. So you may not do very well in how often you screen for triple A's, but if the, you know, 85% of your practice is women who are 20 to 30, that's not really the most important thing for your practice. So just think about it in context of who you are and where you practice. Um, the other thing is talk to other people involved in the process about what doesn't work well. So this happens every month in our AIM staff clinic meeting. Um, they talk about why I do the residents call and try to schedule patients who already have a doctor at Portland. That's, that's, that's the biggest complaint every month. Um, so you need to really talk to other people because they're involved with the care of the patient as well. And then look at complaints. So I get a list of complaints um, every quarter about the number and also I get specifics about them every time. So you can look at complaints because if, it may be that it's not happening often, but it's really bad. Maybe one complaint about someone harassed me is where you should spend all your time because that is an important area, even if it was only just one complaint. So just try to look and see what your data is out there and what's important to you and your practice site. All right. So you should have received some check sheets with data on it. And I want you to, we'll have, we'll have to do something with the lights, Chris. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do that. Um, is it the sun rising? Okay. Look at that. All right, so I'll need to get one of those too, but just look at an area. There should be, I think, eight patients on there. And I wrote at the top if it's male or female. And pick out an area, two or three areas that you think maybe that would be something you would want to work on if this was your patient. Okay, so just looking at it, um, look at the top. Remember, there's female and male, so sometimes that'll matter and sometimes that won't. All right, so have you identified any areas that you think maybe maybe some, you can see what, what are you doing well? Sometimes it's easier to see what you're doing well and mark those off. Or what, what, what areas need some work? BMI and temperature. Okay, BMI, nobody got their BMI done. Oh, one person did, but her BMI was 50, so she was, she was already an obvious person. Okay, and tetanus shots, those weren't doing so well either. Okay, so those are two potential areas. 
we are going to go through this as if we're going to put up a project. So is that, are those some areas you want to focus on or not? All right, so we got to pick one as a group. Anybody at the VA awake or wanting to do this? Well, they are awake, so that's good. Thanks. Did you guys have something you wanted to work on? No, I see Nicole's shaking her net. Okay, fine, we'll go with this. So we're going to pick BMI or tetanus? BMI. Okay, so that's going to be our thing. All right. So we are going to improve. Uh-oh, what happened? Oh, my gosh, I don't know how to do this. So does anybody know how to edit it while I'm actually in this? Chris, thank you. This is your job as a chief. Just in show? Yeah. Okay, so improve. So what are we going to improve? Detection or a recording of PMI? Okay. Oh my gosh. I am inept. Okay. All right. All right. Oh. This, this is not going to work as well as I thought it would. Okay. So we're going to pour, pour the, rec improve recording of our BMI. All right. So look, so now in our model of improvement, we decided we're going to, that's our aim, right? So now will we help know that, it, how will we know that a change is an improvement? That's kind of where we go to now. All right. So you choose a measurement. So what measurement are you going to choose? BMI. Okay. In this, in this situation, you're just going to look at how often. Yeah. Do you know how to do that? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's good. We can do this. Oh, that's that's smart. If you ever want to go back and click slideshow, I really don't want to go back. I don't care. All right. All right. So if we're going to look at the data, so the measurement for us is the BMI. So it's going to be you know percent of patients who get a BMI. So recorded BMI because we can look at them and see. All right. All right. So if you're looking at improvement with data, it's really, really essential in your measurement and your quality improvement process. Because without good data, you can't really figure out if what you need. Okay. So that was back before. You know, we had to have some data to figure out which project we were going to do. You can't use data and measure a change. You have to use data to help you develop the individual action plans and to change systems to improve the care and for residency educational programs too. So you can use this process just in residency. All right. So if you're looking at measures, what, there's some things you want to think about when you're looking at measures. One is that you want to plot data over time. So if this is just, um, if it's complaints, that might be fine, but you have to have something that you can measure over and over, okay? And you have to use enough data to make sure that it's effective or not. So it's, this is not like a randomized control uh, trial where you guys try to eliminate all biases, get as much data as possible, okay? You're just trying to get enough that you can figure out we're doing a good job or we're not doing. So this has only eight patients, and this is, en this is enough with BMI. You can see the BMI was done one out of eight times. We're not doing well in that area, okay? So you just need enough data to get some trends. Um, you're using sampling, so this was based on, you know, patients in your uh, panel. And you want to integrate it into daily work. So you don't want to measure something that somebody has to go out of their way to add into their workflow in order for you to measure outcomes. So um, an easy thing that comes to mind is A1Cs. We already use them in clinic. That's something we could do really easily. We already weigh patients in clinic, so this is a fairly easy measure. All we have to do is just calculate the BMI now. BMI now. You know, we already give shots if you were thinking about tetanus. But if you were thinking about um, something where we had to scan them over to radiology or back, that might be a much harder thing to measure. And then use qualitative and quantitative data. So the numbers are really good. But you also want to talk to people. So, you know, sometimes people would have filled this out and said, well, all these people refused their tetanus shot. I offered it to all of them. And so that's just a difference in recording or something that you have to figure out, you know, in the communication. The other thing is that sometimes other people involved in this process will have insight. Well, we don't do that because when we used to do it, uh, the patients got mad or, you know, whatever. So just, just get other information, as much information as possible. All right. So now if you're going to make an AIM statement, that is really combining the area you want to improve, which is very, very specific, 
the measurement to see if it's changed is specific or is effective in time. And should so you should have a deadline whenever you make a goal for yourself. All right. So if we're making an aim statement, say that we're improving diabetic foot screens, that would be your aim. But a better one would be improving the foot screens from 25 to 75 percent. And the best, because it's specific and has a deadline and measurable, is that we're going to improve our diabetic foot screens from 20 to 70 percent, 75 percent by this date. Okay. So so it's very very specific. All right, so what are we going to try to measure to see if we're going to, pro you know, to make progress here? We're going to improve our BMIs, okay, from what? What is one eighth? Sixteen percent? Really, are we all that bad in math now? One twelfth. Sorry, let's say twelve percent to what? What would what would be your goal? Ninety percent. Somebody very. It doesn't always have to be a hundred percent. You know, sometimes going from 20, 12 to sixty percent would be a huge change. Okay. You do have to identify the problem. Okay. Right. Okay, so your point, Ken, is for the people at the VA, Ken's point was that this is something we already have a lot of data about. We have everybody's weight, but just don't have their height, and it maybe it's not a stretch to go to 90%. That's true. So, you know, if we were doing urine microalbumins, which requires a patient to pee somewhere else and take it, the sample, that might be much harder to get to 90% because, um, because there are other steps in other places that are involved. Okay, so our measure is to improve our BMI, improve by what date? This is random. We can just make this up. No. Okay. So, so somebody said Thursday, and I know you're, like, doing that to jerk my chain. But, you know, the people who do a lot of quality improvement work say, what are we going, what change are we going to make every Tuesday? So the idea of this is not to make huge changes. The idea is to make small changes and follow them and make a lot of them and improve on the process and to see what you do and how well you do it quickly and then um, – tweak it and then modify it and then keep it improve it so so even though you said Tuesday that's fine let's I mean Thursday let's go um, let's just go with Thursday no let's not okay <laughs> January 1st how's that all right so looking back at this model right we figured out what we're trying to accomplish we figured out what we're going to measure the BMI and now what change can we make that will result in improvement so now you've got to think about how am I going to improve, not work harder or, or try harder, but to work differently, which means a change in the system. And remember, every system's set up to achieve the results. So we get weights on everybody, but we don't get heights on anybody. And Ken's point was, why is that? And that's a, a big part of it. So the, I, this is sort of the illustration of what I was just saying. This is the idea of process of many changes, and you roll from one, and it sparks changes in another area and another and another, and so that you build on that, and, and gradually the slope of this is improvement. But it's probably not this linear. It's probably, you know, goes down and up and down, up and up. All right. So if you're looking at the cycle of changes, this is the PDSA cycle. The plan is something, for instance, a resident and the staff come up with a quality improvement idea. The do is that one resident tries to see how this changes in his or her practice, and they studied it, and it was successful. And then act, maybe they implemented it for all the Tuesday morning doctors or afternoon doctors. And again, they looked at it and studied it and it was successful, and then they extrapolated it to the whole clinic. And then it wasn't as successful. You do the PDSA cycle and you figure out, it doesn't work, it's just the Tuesday afternoon people. What are different about those people um, in a good way? All right. Um, and then you have to modify it for the entire system and, and study it again to see that, okay, here's the issue, um, here's how we fix it and, and extrapolate it to the whole clinic. All right. So how to actually start a PDSA, you start with a plan, because that's the first letter, right? All right, so in a plan, you're going to identify the problems and the processes first. That's just what Kim was saying. Maybe we don't get heights for our BMI. Describe what we currently do, so the current process and the improvement opportunity. So how do patients actually get in the clinic? You know, why do they get a BMI, that sort of thing. Figure out the root causes. That means, you know, what is the possible causes of the problem? And then try to find an effective plan um, that addresses these things. So you figured out what's wrong, where the things are going wrong, and then you go to the select the targets. Okay. 
The do part is just implementing the solution, and then the study is that you review the data, and then you'll have to um, look at your data and see if you're an improvement or not. So most of the time it's either medical record audit, patient satisfaction. We do those in AIM Clinic, actually, so we get Prescani um, uh, scores every month. So a lot of your patients are being surveyed about that, so that's already built in, and the organization pays for that. So there's lots of er you know, areas that we can look at. All right. And then ACT, you figure out what went, what went on, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Sometimes it works, but it's really, really burdensome for everyone, and so you need to change the process a little bit to make it easier for people to make it successful and sustainable. Um, look at your results, try to figure out some changes, and then continue on. And then here's a good one, celebrate success, which is nice. Okay, tell people, this is really great, we worked on this, you know, and I think as physicians we don't do this very well. Certainly we don't do it well in AIM clinic, which I'm part of. Um, so this is an important thing. If things work better, that's great. That's really what we're after. All right, so looking at the plan. First, identify the problems and processes first. And you can do this by looking at your existing data, like what actually happens in the system. Sit down and brainstorm. And you guys brainstorm all the time. We do that for town hall meetings. You do that uh, a lot. And there's a couple of different ways to brainstorm, which I never was really aware of. One is called structured. So that's really helpful if you have a room where you think there's a big power differential. Like you have people that you think are involved in it that will probably have a lot of great ideas, but they're not going to speak up because their boss is there and is going to create penance for them if they speak up. So in a structured one, everyone gets a say. If it's a really sort of malignant culture, maybe that's what you need to improve your process. Um, but, you know, you can have those people secretly put in ballots. Okay, here are the top five problems. And then the whole group votes on it, and then you find the top three problems and you go from there or something like that. So if you have a, a big um, differential, that's a useful thing. Unstructured is what we do a lot, is that everybody just kind of shouts out, okay, I think this is the problem, or um, this is um, not a problem. But, but beware of people who are quiet. Not beware of them, they're, they're fine. But beware that people, <laughs> I'm really quiet, so that's an issue. But, you know, just realize that people are really quiet, sometimes won't speak up in this process, and they often have a really, really good idea. So if you're going to use an unstructured way to get some brainstorming ideas, just make sure that you get input from everybody. You know, you notice that someone's in the room and not saying a lot. Say, hey, what do you think about this? You know, and sometimes it'll just spout out things that are amazing. These are actual tools. There's lots of other tools that exist. Um, we have some books for quality improvement now that you do with your chart audit, um, and there's lots of them, and you can look at them in there. Basically, they're designed to get a lot, of quiz, a lot of ideas out on the table quickly, so you don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I spent probably more time talking about it right now than you would probably spend in a real QI situation, okay? So it's a thing. Second thing is you've got to figure out who's going to help you in this. So one of the problems with the QI curriculum that I created is that I didn't do this well. Um, so now, um, for the people who've done your chart review, thank you. Uh, but it's not very uh, effective because we've not involved the medical staff and things in AIM in those changes. So now I have to go back and revamp our QI program, do QI on our QI because, um, because it's not working well. So whenever you're looking at a team, one thing is you want to make sure that the people who have power in that position have buy-in. So if you are that person, great, you automatically have that. Um, you want, it helps you overcome barriers. Um, they have the authority to institute changes, but they'll also be the person who, you know, pushes through the changes. You need somebody with technical expertise. So if it's a computer glitch, you need somebody who understands computers. Um, if it's uh, a process problem in the clinic, you need the medical assistants who actually do the process to tell you. Um, and then you have the day-to-day -day leaders. You'll have somebody who says, okay, we're going to do this. You know, these are the people who do the work. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to make it happen. And they have some practical knowledge of the barriers. Okay, this is why we don't check the height because we don't have a ruler in the clinic. All right. So for our, pro our PDSA project, uh, we looked at the data, we thought about what works and doesn't in our problem. So who do you think, if we were going to look at BMIs in our clinic, who would need to be involved if we were creating a team? Okay, MAs. And maybe not all of them, okay? One or two. You don't have to have everybody. Because if you had a huge practice, like a 50 physician group practice, you wouldn't want 100, you know, 50 MAs in the, on the team. You wouldn't get anything done. Okay, who else needs to be involved? Okay, some of the residents, right? 
And who's going to be your champion? Is it going to be one of the residents? Which it could be. I heard, I heard no champion votes. Okay, uh, let's just say me, because I will, can't even spell my own name. Um, I'll be in there. And then the other person that you probably need in our clinic, and I use the clinic because I know that system and you guys almost all go through there, um, is the clinic manager, because she gets things done. So if you don't know Jan, that's too bad. But she is a go-getter. So those, for if I was going to do a project in AIM, these are the people I would involve. If it was about anticoagulation, which we also run in AIM, you'd have to use the pharmacists who are involved with that. If it was about the telephone notes um, not getting to you, you'd have to deal with the telephone operators and the people who handle that aspect. But for this problem, our problem, we don't really need to involve those people necessarily. Okay? So describe the next, the next part, part of the system or the, the approach is describing what you currently do and you know, how we get BMIs on people. So one way to do this is called flow charting. And this is people who, I guess, do this for a living. They have a little oval that's for start, processes to do something. If there's a question like a decision tree, it's, you know, the, the um, what is this called, diamond, input, outputs, that sort of stuff. So you can use this, but you can just use this as a um, template. You don't have to create one of these to be successful, okay? Here is one, if you're going to do flow charting, what's really helpful. Okay, try not to make too many branches, okay? Patient makes an appointment, they check in, they're brought to the room, they're examined, we do the paperwork, they're checked out. This is just for a patient flow in and out of a chart. Okay, so they didn't have too much detail, they got all the necessary information. They did how it actually occurred and not what should occur, but actually occurred. Okay, that's an important thing. And then you need to show it to other people that are involved to make sure that it's true. All right, let me just show you what I did, which was wrong. Nope, that's not it. This is the flow sheet for how our patients check in the AIM. So whenever I was first starting this, this is what I did. It's a little bit better now, but patient comes in. Uh, do they have the right clinic? Because a lot of them from OB Gym are checking in there. Yes. Is there a line? Yes. If there was, they go to the waiting room and they get called back. And then they register. And then, you know, they make a... This is too much information. Okay. It actually helped me because I'm a detailed person and I found a lot of opportunities for improvement. But if you're looking at a big process, it's probably a little bit too much. All right. <clears throat> so that was useful. So our problem is not checking the MI, um, the BMI. So how how do we? All right. So how would we start? When, where would the start point be for us? For our patients. Okay. BMI, remember, is your weight over your height. Squared, squared. Okay. Patient brought back for uh, vitals. Okay. All right. So they do the weight. They do the weight. What else do they do? They don't check height. They don't. Okay. So they ask about what height. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, and then they do, you know, then they do like the blood pressure and pulse or whatever, and then they would room the patient. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So we could put this, you can think about it. This is just a formal way to do it. You can put it in a flow chart, but you don't have to. You just have to think about what actually, so you want it to be act what actually happens, not what you think should happen. Because the should is they're not asking about the height, right? I mean, they're not measuring the height in this case. All right. So now you have to go to why does that happen? This is the root causes. Why do, what are all the possible causes of this problem? So then you think about root causes. And, and there's a couple of tools that you can use to figure this out. But again, um, these are just ways of looking at data. You don't have to use the tools. It's useful if you're going to compare data, so the tools help you with that way. So there's something called a fishbone or Ishawara diagram where you look at root causes. And then the histogram and parietal chart re require data. So they're both sort of graphic representations. The parietal chart is in descending order. So here's the fishbone diagram, and this is why it's called fishbone, because it looks like the skeleton. And here it is in actuality. 
Um, and this is a little small because we had to minimize it, but you know, it can be things like equipment. You know, here are the equipment things that cause the problems. Your problem here is we're not checking the height, right? Um, process problems, we don't have a, a equipment, we don't have the measurements, we don't have the rulers, you know, we don't have uh, anything to measure heights. Process is patients have on shoes and they don't have a comfortable place to lean against the wall or something like that. People is patients don't want to do it, you know. Uh, materials, that sort of stuff. So you, you may have all of these things. You don't have to fill in something for everything. Some things will be logical and some things won't. So one of them might be time. You know, patients are in a hurry to get into the room and they don't want to measure their height. Or, um, you know, equipment or something like that. Or MAs don't really know how to measure the height, you know, which seems a little, seems a little scary. Okay, so if you were looking at a histogram, this is something about complaints about clinic. And if you looked at it, you can see the most common complaint here was the time in the waiting room. This is not real data. This is my imagined data, by the way. Um, some were really upset that they didn't get the requested med. And though that's your second top complaint, that might not be the one you care about. Because if this is all people with wanting more tabs and you said no appropriately, then that may not be the thing you want to improve on. So it may be a big complaint, but it may not be clinically important. All right, here's a parietal chart, which is similar to a histogram, but it's just in descending order, so you can just see it pretty easily. So time in the waiting room is the biggest one, and then didn't get the requested med, lack of continuity, follow-up not made it, check out, telephone wait, and then the staff is rude. And again, that one's really, really low, but maybe that's the most important thing to you. So you can just use these to help you figure out the process. All right. All right, so we didn't really do root causes here. So if you're thinking about why we don't measure height, what would that be? I mean, because that's kind of what we just, that's where we decide, okay, they get the weight, we're not getting the height, we've already sort of identified the place where it's a problem. They, they either don't get the height or they don't know how to calculate BMI or some other things. So looking at root causes, what can you think of? I already just said some of it. No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, there is. A, actually, there is a spot of space. There is a space. So that's a good thought. Okay, does there even a place to record it? Because sometimes that's the issue. That's a good thought. So looking at your tools. Right, they write every, they fill in all those blanks at the top. You're right. So if it's up there, maybe that would be the thing. And if there wasn't a spot for height, that might be a really easy place to do an intervention. So looking at your root causes helps you figure out what your intervention will be, too. All right. They sign every time they chart. So if you look under patient here to see Dr. Drain, Sylvia Kelty, Kelty, that's what she says. Yeah, I'll show you Monday. <laughs> so our scale does not have a, a thing on it that measures height. Um, and part of that's because we got a scale that measures really heavily people. And so those heavy ones that have things on it where you can be stabilized don't have a way to do their height because the floor of the scale goes up and down. So no, we don't have a, we don't have a measurement that way. Okay, so we could get a wall script. So we don't we don't have a way to measure height. There is the biggest problem. <laughs> um, okay, and you might say that the other barrier might be patients. They don't want to take off their shoes and stand on the floor in a clinic because one, it's cold in there, and two, yick, you know, standing in your bare feet or whatever in a doctor's office where all these microbes are floating around. Maybe people don't want to do it. Um, so those, those are several barriers. So you, you identified a bunch of root causes. Okay, great. All right. So now you're going to the, what you're going to select is your target. So figure out some effective and workable solutions. Um, so that might be lots of things. And a way to think about them is think about, if you're thinking about things to do, the best thing to do is something that's really important and easy to do. So maybe in this case, getting a wall chart that you paste on the wall, just like I have for my kids when they were two years old, is the thing to do. You know, that's easy, it's inexpensive, um, and you can see if it makes a difference. Okay. If it's really hard to do and it's not important, you don't want to do those things. So um, that's kind of how you think of when you're implementing, picking out something to do, some, some intervention to do, think about the things that are important. 
And there are some things that are really important but hard to do, and maybe that's something you want to tackle in the long run. But that's a longer project, and that's not part of these short cycles, okay? And sometimes it may be easy, really easy, but not important. And sometimes you're going to do those anyway just to kind of get people on board with the process or to be able to tell your staff, oh, you did a great job in this way. So sometimes there's other things that come into those decisions. All right. So the do phase. You anticipate and address barriers to implementation. So if you're thinking about we are going to, we can't buy a, a measurement thing that goes on the scale, we're going to put it up on the wall. What kind of barriers do you anticipate are going to happen that are going to prevent MAs from measuring people's height? Pardon me? Okay, the sticker's going to come off. All right, so you're saying the thing may come off the wall, right? So we might want to get something that's heavy duty and not just flimsy. All right. Okay, so a lot of people don't want to take their shoes off, especially in winter. You know, if you're wearing flip-flops in the summer, maybe it doesn't matter, but in the winter people don't want to take their shoes off. So how could you get around that? Okay, so you could put down something like a towel, you know, that we take. The problem is that some patients will slip, so you need something that's um, steady there. So you need some sort of little grip system plus something that's clean and replaceable that you can put on there. Because there will be some patients who, after they get on there, I would not get on there. You know, they have the, they have the little stinky feet. But just for, just for sanity's sake, you probably just want to have something that you can change out between every patient. Okay. They can't bend over to take their shoes off. I don't think we can fix that with the QI project. Um, but that might be an issue. Absolutely. No, it is true. It's true. And so we either have to figure out a, a chair there for them to sit in, and we can take off their shoes or something like that. Okay, those are patient barriers. Any, any staff barriers? Okay. Right, so now you're talking about extra time for the people. So do the medical assistants have enough time to actually do this? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, sometimes with the first patients, they get them back quickly, and then they're sitting around for a while. So it might be doable for some of them, but you're right. You're going to have to have time for the patient to sit down, take off their shoes, get off. The medical assistant to change out the um, sanitary barrier every time, or whatever you call it. Okay, any other barriers? Okay, somebody has big hair, you're going to have to push it down, so that's an accuracy issue. The other thing is, remember, some of our medical assistants are pretty, pretty petite, and so they're trying, to measure, they're trying to measure people that are 6'2", um, so how are we going to do that? We're not going to get them a step stool. You know, there's got to be some other system in place. Um, so there are systems, you know, pediatricians use that have like a little lever that goes up and down on the wall that maybe that's the way to do it for us. I don't know. Okay, so if you're in the do phase, you've got to think about all these things, and this is where it's really important to discuss it with everybody, with the medical assistants, with the people, in this case, with the medical assistants especially, because they're the ones that are going to be doing it. And I guarantee you they'll have different barriers than we've thought of. Um, in the do phase, then you start saying, okay, when you've worked out all the kinks and trying to find the best thing for you, um, you start, you say, okay, we're going to start this. This is, this is what we're doing. And, and in this case, you would talk to all the medical assistants, um, you would talk to the people um, in, like Jan, the clinic manager, who makes sure that things get implemented, that sort of stuff. You're going to modify your final project. So maybe the other thing that we haven't talked about as a barrier is that nobody's identified that if we get height and weight, we're going to actually get a BMI. So now, you know, that's not on the note sheet. You know, where are they going to write this if they do that? You know, the, the weight and the height, are we going to calculate it? Or because the weight, height, and weight are already on there, so we're not doing something. So is you know maybe our project should be, you know, putting another spot on the on the sheet. I mean, there's lots of lots of little projects that you could do. So you have to figure out which one you're going to do, and then implement it, and then restudy it again. All right. After a period of time that you decide, then you remeasure the outcome. So it doesn't have to be a long period like we talked about. And then you're going to compare to the pre-intervention phase. So hopefully your BMI. Um, measurement or recording would go up to 50% from 12%, but maybe it didn't change at all. 
in which case you've had a failure and that's okay. What do you go back and reanalyze it and say, well, it didn't work because of this barrier and you adjust that barrier and reimplement it. Or sometimes you scrap it entirely. It's just not important. Okay. Then in the act phase, you modify the project based on your results, you know, and you use the same implementation cycle again, and then you start over with the new project. So it's just the same uh, process over and over again. All right. Any questions? So if we were going to do this in AIM, which, what would you do first? What would be your project? What would y'all do? Because we don't calculate BMI, and so maybe I'll do something about this in clinic. So what, what would be, I don't care, what would be that? Let's vote on one, and I'll do whatever you guys want. I hear nothing, really, I don't. No, no, we just did the BMI. We, we're not doing anything. We're doing something related to BMI. <laughs> we're not going through the whole process with vaccinations, but thanks. We'll work on vaccinations another day. So if we're going to do something for BMI, what would, based on what we talked about here, what would, what would you guys do? Get a what? Stadiometer? What is that? Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we're just going to get it and that's it? Okay, so uh, I have two proposals. One is to get the measurement tool, which Adam very nicely calls a stadiometer. Is that right? Yeah, okay, good. Learn something. And the other one is just to put a slot for BMI on the thing and use their self-reported height. So what do you guys want to do? Any other thoughts? Both of those are good projects, and you could do both of them, but you probably just want to do one at a time. Okay, you could just put the BMI chart on the wall. Like, what is your BMI? Put that in the conference area, is that what you're saying? Or So you're having the MAs do the BMI measure? Okay. So where, where are they going to record it? So either... So we're going to do two things. Get a chart so that they can look at the BMIs and then have a spot on the sheet to record it. Okay, we can do that. And what? And a stadiometer. Okay, so now you're tossing me some money. Okay, so. For the interest of time, maybe our goal should be to get a height on the patient if they're initially visited, record it on the sheet, and have the MA record that same height to the upon visit on the patient's height at the end of the chain. Okay, so Neil's idea is just to get a height at the initial visit and then use that one from then on. Yeah, and if it stays there for 12 hours, then they can. Well, but I don't think that I'm smaller, but every time I get measured at the doctor's office, I am, which really is disturbing because I'm not that old. Hmm? Yeah, it'll change. Like a half an inch will change your BMI. Yeah, we could set a time period. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we've got several proposals. These are all good ideas. Height change has more than BMI implications. Then you get into osteoporosis screening. That's a whole different thing. Okay. They usually actually ask the patient how much you, how much they, how tall they are, and the patients tell them. What I would tell my doctor would be different than what I am. <laughs> okay. So that's that's a lovely thought to to give a patient a, a card, which we do have in the clinic, that has everything on it: their medications, their problems, their BMI, whatever. Um, do you work at AIM Clinic? <laughs> because that, that, they don't even know what medicines are. That doesn't work very well. So that, that is a great solution, but that's a huge solution. So we want to find something that's small and doable, and we can measure in the next month. I don't know. Somebody, I, I don't know. Maybe the loss of height does affect your BMI, but I don't know how much it does. So we have to make a decision. We have, we have 10 minutes to make a decision. 
what we're going to do. Okay, nobody knows the MA's names. Okay, this is a huge barrier. So, yeah, they do know your name. <laughs> okay, so Alan has a good point that sometimes when you start talking about the solutions is that you realize there's a bigger problem or a different problem, and sometimes you shift what you're going to do. So, Alan says, okay, I don't feel comfortable telling, talking to people and saying, please do this for me, and I don't even know your name. You're right. That is a, that is a very um, difficult situation. You can't, you can't get them to buy in if you don't know their name. You don't know who Jan is. She's rock, she rocks. Okay. But she's not a medical assistant. She's the clinic director. But, yeah, you're right. You don't know her. So... Okay, so just ask the patient their weights, have a BMI chart that we can put at every medical uh, assistant. Yeah, ask them their height. They already do that. No, they weigh them because they don't believe their weight. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Chris, are you looking it up? So the question is, if you, if you fudge on your height, how much does that really affect your BMI? No. Okay, so Chris? So I was just kind of playing with the numbers here. Why don't you come up here since, so they can hear too? Yes, I was just playing with it because what, what you're essentially doing is changing the numerator. Um, and uh, so basically, like if you have a 68-inch person, 200 pounds, it's a BMI of 30. Uh, you then lose one inch on the 67, that goes up to 31.3. Um, so you, it changes by about one each inch, uh, give or take. But then again, like the lower the height, the if the weight stays the same, it's going to change more dramatically. It's one of those things. So, so yeah, it, so it does change by one. So uh, as far as like a billing thing is concerned, you know, that can make the difference between obese versus overweight yeah. uh, versus morbidly obese. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, you could measure if they were borderline. Okay, so here, here's the other thing is that you realize when you start doing quality improvement projects that you can't fix everything in one cycle. There are lots of things to be fixed, and that is somewhat depressing and also somewhat a relief because if this one little thing doesn't work, you can try something else. Okay, So I, personally, I think the thing that's going to require the least training and the least buy-in is to change the form and to change and just to show them what a BMI is. Okay, so at our next staff meeting, I will teach them what a BMI is and how to look it up because they'll have to be trained on it. Remember, they don't necessarily inherently know. And I'll get those um, posters for their little cubicles, and we'll put a place on the form, and then we'll see. So when do you want to figure out if this works or not? Yeah. I can't hear you all. I'll just hear you're going to have to get closer, I think. I'm sorry. Oh, the BMI wheel. Oh, yeah, that's even better. That's cheaper. The wheel of misfortune. Okay. All right, that's great. All right, so we can do that instead. Yeah, that's true. The, the advantage of having something on the wall is that they can teach the patient. They can show them where they are and then say, okay, if you lose 10 pounds, you'll be not overweight. You'll be, you know, at normal weight. So that's the advantage of that. But I'll just see whatever's cheaper and what the MAs want to do, and I'll use that. How's that? Okay, so we'll... We'll do that. These are made-up numbers, but I actually have several people who have done um, this part of their uh, checklist, and we'll just see in about two months what, what happens. All right. Are there any questions about QI or how do you start out on a project? So in a, Okay, so in a month, who do you measure? And I don't measure it for tech uh, because that's a hard – we don't track that data in AIM. Uh, even though one medical assistant is generally assigned to one person, if you're out, they may be working with someone else. So we usually track it by the le resident level. 
So somebody who's already... Right, so are that... Well, you measure at the resident level because that's where we have the information. So, for instance, Neil, you did the screening observation checklist, didn't you? Yeah, you did that one. So he did that, and I think Sherry did. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I already have some data for some of the people, and I would go back to theirs and see if it made a difference. And if not, I don't give feedback to Sherry and Neil because they haven't done anything. I give feedback to the medical assistants who work with them saying, ah, you're not doing the BMI. Here's the data before. Here's the data after. We're not doing it. Why did this work or not work? Yeah. So you use whatever measurements you have, but you direct the feedback to where it should be. All right. Any other questions?